We're talking with Marshall Fritz, founder of Advocates for Self-Government. Marshall's got some intriguing ideas on new educational ideas, a refinement of old ideas and new ideas, a synthesis that might get us some schools that actually educated kids, schools in which kids would be happy to be a part. That would be a change for education in the United States. We invite you to join us. Easy to do. 5201-KFI from L.A. in the Valley or 1-800-553-4640 from Orange County. And across Southern California, Tom from San Bernardino, first-time caller. Welcome to KFI. Yeah, I mean, uh, tra- our traffic laws here in Radio Land that you won't be there anymore. Well, thank you. But uh, I hope you're uh, dropping a few uh, questionnaires and uh, applications so we can come back. <laughs> well, <Very well>, thanks. <laughs> but uh, I think this would be wor- uh, worthwhile on a, on a workable, uh, small scale where uh, motivation uh, could, uh, could still be achieved. But what about the uh, what about the welfare recipients where uh, massive uh, reproduction has always been scheduled, and uh, also the incorrigibles that are only in school because the uh, uh, the, 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 the cops come come out and pick them up to mm-hmm. call them in for uh, for truancy and, uh, when they find they're not. Well, good questions. Marshall's already said in the very beginning of our conversation that there would be scholarship money available for poor folks who couldn't send their kids, and that would be poor kids who had no folks to send them. I mean, they could get in on a scholarship as well. But that question of how do you keep the thugs out is a great question, Marshall. How about that? Uh, Basically, there's two kinds of education, voluntary and compulsory. And compulsory education doesn't work. You cannot compel a person to be educated. We talked today about having compulsory education, but we don't really have compulsory education. No one is compelled to learn anything. Correct. And the fact that they'll pass you every year, every year, even if you don't learn something. Well, it's important for their socialization that they stay with their peer group. Right? Right. The other children that don't know their times tables and they're 14 years old. Right. So, um, in this system, it is really best for those rascals. It's the, 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 the good kids, the kids that are the saints or the natural learners and that sort of a thing, they like it and they enjoy it and they do better. But the kids who really blossom, the kids that are saved, are the kids at risk. And if you talk to a teacher like uh, Kay Palish out there in Reno Valley, who's used this with learning disabled, learning handicapped, and now using it with school phobics and all, and the other teachers that have used this thing, they tell me that it's those kids that are the the rascals, the ones that we start losing about the fourth, fifth, sixth grade, sometimes sooner. Uh, Those are the kids that really blossom under the system because they see what's in it for them. They don't don't have a vision of 10 years from now, 15 years from now going to college and uh, you say, hey, you learn those times tables, you're going to make uh, a couple of thousand scholar dollars, and this week you're going to be able to uh, be in the auction, you're going to be able to uh, buy some slimy lizards or something else that's fun for you. you know, fourth graders, they're into slimy lizards. <laughs> um, little toys or something. Then uh, the kid sees something in it for him, and he, and he goes for it. And they don't get into that track where they become incorrigible. If you do get a thug in the classroom, I guess you just get rid of him, right? Oh, I don't. If, if, if you had a, an out-and-out thug, uh, you, you just say, you don't belong here, uh, please leave. We, there, there's a guy who's got an island in the south of the Atlantic somewhere. <laughs> Caller, we appreciate your call. Thank you very much. It is 5.15, 15 minutes after 5, 4th and final hour, Tuesday edition, July 10th. Tom Lyka Show. Gene Byrne sitting in for Tom. Melody, first-time caller from Reno Valley. Welcome to KFI and our guest, Marshall Fritz. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was listening to you on my way home from work, and I was quite interested because Alan Harrison was my fifth grade teacher. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I finally found one of you. <laughs> well, say, now you, what are you going to say? He was absolutely oh. incredible. I <laughs> went to school fifth. I, I was constantly doing extra credit things. The entire class was the most motivated class I've ever been in. He, it was, the system really worked. Melody, could you uh, give... Uh, Greg or the producer, your name and phone number, I would love to touch base with you, or would you write it to me up in Fresno? Oh, sure. I would just love to to uh, contact you and and, and, and and hear more from the in the other side of the story. Melody, what was it about Harrison that, that motivated you? And your, uh, what was the single most important thing about what he was doing that made you interested? Well, you could see that you were going to get something. You know, there, there was something tangible there. I mean, kids at times aren't really interested in, quote, learning. Uh, or at least you don't think so, but he gave you something that motivated you. You knew you were going to get something. I remember looking forward to those auctions and thinking, oh, gee, I need to get 100 on all my tests so that I can have more money for those auctions. Sure. He, he spent, you know, weekends taking us kids. I remember going on a skiing trip. He took us kids I bought at the auction. And it was just 
you could see um, that there really was something that you would get out of it besides just education. But, it, you know, the entire class is real motivated, you know. And as far as troublemakers or anything, there weren't any. Everybody wanted uh, to get ahead. Well, he did what I guess a lot of establishmentarians would say you cannot do, and that is awaken the enlightened self-interest of children. And and that is so self-evident, it's amazing. It's such an idea is around, and we don't catch it. But thank heaven for the Harrisons who bring the obvious to our attention so that we can do something about it. Melody, I appreciate your call. Thank you very much. Leave your name with uh, Greg, if you would, and we'll give it to uh, Marshall, and he can get in touch with you. It's Marshall Fritz, founder of Advocates for Self-Government who lives now in the Fresno area, is our guest, and we're talking about a new idea of education. Mike of Santa Clarita, you're on KFI with our guest. Yes. Hi, Gene, and hi, Marshall. Hi. hi. Uh, boy, you really hit a subject that I really piqued my interest. Uh, I'm a father of four children, and uh, they've all gone through the system, and uh, Lord knows the system is really uh, corrupt. Unfortunately, it was corrupt from the very beginning by a man by the name of John Duty, and it's too bad we can't... Uh, some, somehow pick out all the bureaucrats in the system and start all over again. I think we certainly need some kind of a voucher system so that we could take that money and go to the school of our choice and make these schools, uh, uh, you know, because they'll have to perform in order to stay in business. And I think that right now the, the state and the country is operating under the system where it does not have to perform. It, it just a perpetual. It perpetuates itself and it stays in business. And the bureaucrats up there have a have a vested interest to see that the system keeps going the way it is, and 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 be damned with our children. I think uh, I think I'm I'm for any new ideas. I'm all for any new ideas anybody will have. But unfortunately, I don't think the bureaucrats are going to are going to change anything around because it's too much of a threat to them. Now, in regards to your system, uh, Marshall, I'm wondering, uh, it all sounds really well and good, but I think the bottom line is, in any system, if it doesn't teach a system of values, it's doomed to failure. And I think you, what you can do is maybe teach kids how to become good uh, capitalists, but you're not going to really teach them, uh, uh, you know, the values it's going to take to really, in the, in the long run, uh, get them to the point that they need to be. Now, I had a, a child, my oldest son, he wasn't real uh, academic, but he was, uh, he's grown up now, and he works in the steel business. He's a steel worker. And unfortunately, our schools do not address themselves to those children that, are, that might not be real academically inclined, but have other, um, other um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? They have talents, gifts. Other every, skills every child is gifted uh, differently. Yeah, they have gifts and skills in other areas, and uh, and our teachers and our system is not trying to find out what these gifts and what these skills are in these beloved children of ours. You got it. Well, let's get some comments. You have several questions on the table. Marshall, how about some comments on the gentleman's comment? Um, first of all, I want to know if you're a, a Blumenfeldian. Uh, your comments on Dewey makes me think that you might be a, a friend of Sam Blumenfeld, uh, who hails from uh, Gene Brim's uh, neck of the woods. Well, the whole issue is I think he's brought in a system of, uh, of, uh, of humanism into our system that teaches that everything's right, a system of pragmatism that ultimately will break everything oh, down. you're absolutely correct. I wasn't trying to get a definition of Dewey here because I don't think we have time for that, but, uh, but I, I am in great sympathy with you. Uh, Sam Blumenfeld uh, is a, a friend of mine, and he was, uh, uh, and if you want to, uh, find out some more information on Dewey. Drop me a line and uh, and mention Dewey, and yes. uh, and I will uh, uh, send you uh, or ask, ask uh, Sam to send you some material on that. Well, I can... in terms of the voucher system, could I answer the questions? You've got four questions on the table for me already. Yes, I understand. Yeah. It's just a, such a uh, a subject that I can't hardly keep my mouth shut. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. Go ahead, Mark. You know, all right. All right. <laughs> um, on the voucher system. Um, I see a lot of danger in the voucher system. I used to be quite in favor of the voucher system, but let's go back a couple hundred years and say that we still had the intertwining of church and state back in the old days. Would we have liked a voucher system where you get a voucher from the government and then you go to the church and give it to the church of your choice? Why not? Well, uh, unfortunately, I think that that is giving the government a lot of control that it will misuse because it will say, well, you can only use the voucher in, we, in an approved, a government approved school. And then what you'll have is a degrading, a lowering of the standards. So 
So my school, for instance, will not accept vouchers because I don't want to have to degrade my standards. No, but, but, but what I'm talking about is, Marshall, is you don't let the government put any restrictions on who, where you can take that money to. You, you can't. He, you know the golden rule. Uh, the other one. Now, he who has the gold makes the rule. And they will make the rules. If they're giving you a voucher that's worth $2,500 a year or $3,000 a year, they're going to make the rules. Did you see Bill Honig's article in the Wall Street Journal the other day? What? We're going to voucher system? Why? People would, would teach astrology or creationism or other such things. You couldn't allow the children to go to those kinds of schools. Who cares? You see, he's part of the problem. Yeah, but, he's, but what I'm saying is, is that you've got to remove taxation and compulsory funding from the equation. So just, just privatize. What, see, what we're going to be doing is starting private schools that work that make money, that are affordable to the entire population. And what you'll see is the Berlin Wall of U.S. socialism, i.e., I am speaking of the socialized education system. You'll see it crumble by 1999 because it'll be simply replaced. We'll have private schools everywhere in America, not my company. I mean, we'll maybe have 3% of the market, but competitors and everything. Between the whole bunch of us, we'll see the total privatization of schools. So we're not trying to reform the government schools. Mike, we appreciate your call, and we have to move on. Um, if you want more information, of course, before the end of the hour, we'll give you the address. You can write to Marshall and we'll get some more information. It is 527, 27 minutes after 5, 4th and final hour. Tom Likas show on the 10th of July, 1990. I'm Gene Burns for the vacationing Tom Likas. And Scott of Westlake Village, you're on KFI with our guest. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I've already received your eight-page packet on your, on your uh, system there, and I'm sold on it. Um, I think that, first of all, any just about anything is going to be an improvement on what we've got. I agree it's going to be impossible to reform our, our school, our public school system. And um, I think a separation of state and education would be in everybody's best interest. Um, the idea of private schools that's affordable for the majority of people is something that, that's long overdue. I'm surprised somebody hasn't figured out a way to do it before this. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree with me that a dollar spent in the private sector is, is far more efficiently spent than, than government dollars. Um, my question is, though, how far along are you in your um, organizing process? How much of an organization have you built, and how far along are you? I'm four months, five months into it, and in fact, when people ask me, what is your background in education, you know, your qualification? Is it? Well, I've only been an expert now for four months. And it took a month to become that, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a salesman. And this is actually going to be a bigger sales job than it's going to be an educational job. Uh, my plan is to start January the 2nd, my school system, January the 2nd, 1991, with an after-school tutoring program for a low risk, you know, we'll, because your kid is still going to school. But, gee, wouldn't it be nice if he learned his times tables and somebody was taking care of him in the afternoon? So we'll start with an after-school um, program that will run, you know, from 3 to 6 or whatever. Starting in June 1991, we'll go all day and we'll call it academic day camp. Well, uh, you know, day camp, gee, that sounds okay. And academics, my kids are going to learn some more. It'll be so much fun for the children that by the time we get to September 1991 and we open up the Academy for Self-Governors as a real school, uh, we've got a built-in uh, uh, market in that we've got those uh, 150 to 200 children from uh, that uh, summer, that day camp that say, hey, mom, um, why should I ever go back to that other school where I don't learn anything, kids pick on me, and, uh, you know, it's a lot more fun here, and I'm learning three times as fast. So, and mom and dad at that point say, yeah, we can afford $150 a month to keep you in that good school. So that's the game plan at the moment, and I'm out looking for, this is not, uh, I'm putting together the organizational aspects of it right now. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I assume, uh, have you finished with your, your business plan or your blueprint? Oh, okay. In fact, uh, that letter I sent to you announcing that I was going to write that is still true, and I'm still going to write that, but no, I have not uh, written that. By the way, do you and I know each other, Scott, or I don't recognize a Scott in Westlake Village, and I rented some lists of other people, like uh, subscribers to uh, uh, Reason Magazine from here in Los Angeles. So, so do you and I know each other already? No, no. I just uh, I recently was, uh, registered as a libertarian, and I'm, I'm almost positive that's how I got Okay, because I, re I read 9,000 names from the Libertarian Party. Libertarians find this very easy to understand and accept because they appreciate the free market, so it's the obvious place to start. All right, Scott, we appreciate your call. Thank you very much. Marshall Fritz is our guest, and we're moving into the final portion of Tom Likas' show on KFI in Los Angeles. We'll continue our conversation with you on the subject of education. Marshall Fritz, our guest, we're talking about an interesting concept in education. And Dana, first-time caller from Long Beach, you're on KFI with our guest. Yes, um, I went to school, elementary school in Torrance, 
and was in a gifted program where the teacher implemented a similar type of program for, you know, the period of day that she had us. And uh, she incorporated some other ideas um, where students could take jobs, which you would actually learn something in and be paid for that. And, you know, for example, um, a banker. If you have money, you need a banker. Mm-hmm. Or you could do money. And the, that student would have to keep books and records, and they'd be learning their math and bookkeeping skills. Right. And we had um, a newspaper, and students could buy the newspaper for money, and the journalist would be paid. And, of course, the person that ran the paper would have to pay for the paper to the school. Um, also, like you mentioned, that the teachers, the older students to help the younger students, would get paid for their work. Um, you, and uh, you mentioned that the students would be disciplining themselves. You could extend it to perhaps sort of a judiciary system with the appellate being mm-hmm. teachers themselves. Right. Um, we got money, our type of money, for um, entering. Um, contest, and if we won them, not only would we get whatever we won from the contest, but we would get some additional type of money um, from our whatever, from our teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have some questions for you. Dana, I had a question for you. Sure. What year was it that you were there? That that was done? Can you, can you recall? Was it after 1970? Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. Early 70s? Alan Harrison trained. Um, her name was uh, Mrs. Kurtz. Mrs. Kurtz, okay. And I couldn't tell you the first name because we weren't allowed. <laughs> um, but I'll, uh, Alan trained a number of teachers from Torrance Unified, and it would be neat to be able to track one down who had used the system. So well, that, it was Hick- Hickory Elementary School. Okay. That's enough information there. Now, go ahead. You asked me the question. Um, if a student was, say, ostracized by the other students or perhaps was a natural loner, would they still be able to earn money just for learning the subject on their own? Oh, yes. Oh, for sure. And and you bring up something I think that's important there. What children are going to be able to learn is how to get along with and cooperate with other children, other people, better in in a safer environment. So those kids that are uh, are, um, uh, difficult, uh, well, I was a very difficult child. And uh, and I didn't start improving until I was 15 years old. And I think under this kind of a system, I could have. And I know guys that did, didn't start straightening up until they were uh, 30, 40, or 50 years old. And under this kind of a system, I think that you've got a a much softer, uh, a much safer way for a child to make uh, life's mistakes and then start correcting them so that they don't get as far out of whack as uh, as some children become. I do have one other real quick question for you. Um, I've done some teaching under an emergency credential, and my mother is a teacher, and both of us feel very strongly about teaching in the public schools for the simple reason that it pays better. How are you going to attract better teachers or teachers willing to handle more kids, albeit in a more limited fashion? I suspect that... um that because the large number of children that the teacher will be able to handle, that I'll be able to to pay more, um, then I'll be able to pay whatever it takes to get the very best uh, teachers to come into our system. So I really think that we won't have any trouble attracting um, uh, teachers, because if I meet or beat the government school system, and at the same time they've got kids that really want to learn, they don't have discipline problems, they don't have administration problems, they don't have kids coming in from teachers that didn't do the job the year before, uh, you've got an environment where how many of your better teachers would love to move to that. Dana, we appreciate your call. Thank you very much. We hope you'll call KFI again. Marshall Fritz, our guest on the Tom Likas Show. I'm Gene Burns for Tom, who's on vacation. It is 5.40, 20 minutes before 6 o'clock, and we're in our fourth and final hour. Gib, first-time caller from Fox Hills. Welcome to KFI and Marshall Fritz. Thank you. Uh, Gene, nice to hear this program. I Thank you. I think it's long overdue that somebody talked in some meaningful way about education. Right. I think also you're making the right approach when you decide to do this on a private basis because I have put together an educational program of my own and approached the school system, even got the school system to accept it. To get them to implement it is impossible. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions that I make. Sure. Uh, where do your scholar dollars come from? Um, the, 
I don't want to call it the Federal Reserve Board. <laughs> the School Reserve Board. The uh, basically the, the the scholar dollars are kind of like monopoly money, in that the school and we're having some minted. You can hear my prototypes here uh, tinkle a little bit. And if you've ever seen the uh, doubloons that they use, the little aluminum coins, where they're about the size of a silver dollar, the doubloons that are used at the uh, Mardi Gras, then you have a, an idea of what, uh, and a bronze is 10, and a silver is 100, and a gold is 1,000. What about the actual funds to back them up? Oh, the funds for the school, there's not a direct, uh, it's not, won't be as in, in, in uh, what do they call it, uh, it won't be like the ruble, that you can't convert at all, inconvertible, <laughs> but uh, it'll just be a whatever natural market there is between uh, you know, U.S. Federal Reserve notes and the, and the scholar dollars, but, they, but there's not meant to be a, uh, uh, an actual uh, convertible currency. So they're backed up by the, the backing, if you will, is the auctions that that the uh, school provides and that the teachers provide that uh, that have the things that the kids think are fun. And those prizes come out of money that the school will the school will provide that money as an operating expense. Two things: one, the school will provide some of that as the operating expense. The other thing is is that uh, from the teachers that have used this before, the parents really get involved. And some granddad says, "Hey, I'm flying to uh, I've got an airplane. I'd love to fly to Catalina. Why don't I uh, why don't you put up in my kids' fifth grade, my grandkids' fifth grade class? Why don't you put up a, uh, a flight to Catalina and see how many scholar dollars you can sell that for? And I'll take three extra kids to with me to Catalina. The parents' permission, and the kids go. How does this reduce the cost of education? Well, you're, you're, most of the of the uh, co- much of the cost of uh, two ways. One, we need only one aid teacher for something about ninety to one hundred and ten kids. That's one thing. Also, the children do in the prior call or Dana. Uh, the kids do most of the work at the school. So they do the uh, the housekeeping, they do the janitorial work, they do the bookkeeping, they do the accounting, and they get paid in scholar dollars for that. So the kids are a bunch of industrious little... I've been asking people, did you hire a service to clean up after your kid when he was 10 years old or so? And people say, no, I never. I mean, not until the kids moved out of college or moved away do we ever hire them. Not until they got into the uh, public education system. That's right. So, so why do the governments hire these janitors to clean up after the kids, and why does this place such a mess? And finally, where well, can we get some literature and some follow-up on <laughs> I love to give my address. <laughs> uh, so that's may I, should I answer sure, yeah, question, Gene? Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, if you send one dollar, I'll send you an eight-page report. If you send twelve dollars, I'll send you that report and Alan Harrison's book and a cassette tape by George Smith on the uh, the history of how the schools were taken over by the government in the 1840s through the 1890s. So. You will send one or send twelve dollars for the little package or the big package. The address is Advocates for Self Government, nine four zero East Bremer B R E M E R, Fresno, California, nine three seven two eight. And uh, money back guarantee if anybody's ever dissatisfied. In fact, that same thing goes. I should have mentioned it. They mentioned it off the air. For the school, is that uh, you know I have a money back guarantee for the parents. So if you uh, don't like it, uh, you know you get your tuition back and. And your kid back. Yeah, thanks for your call. We appreciate it. I hope you'll call KFI again. And we'll talk more with you just ahead on KFI in Los Angeles. Marshall Fritz, our guest, we're talking about education, and we invite you to join us on KFI uh, as we continue to do that. Al, you're on KFI with our guest. Hello? Yeah, Al, go ahead. Hello? Yes, hello. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I was curious. Suppose you have a, uh, a situation which is pretty common here in L.A., uh, where you, you might have a single parent uh, family, and you know the mother's got five kids. That's 150 bucks a kid you're proposing. That's 750 dollars a month. Where's she going to come up with this? You've talked about scholarships. In the, early, in the earlier part of the show, we talked about scholarships, and I think a single mother, uh, you know, unless she was real wealthy or something like that, certainly isn't going to be able to afford 750 dollars a month. So she would be uh, getting a scholarship for. Uh, uh, maybe a full ride, or maybe she's getting an 80% scholarship, so she ends up paying $150 a month for all five. Yeah, but who's going to come up with a scholarship money? money uh, the, the system is, and it's, uh, I, I, we don't have time to, to describe it, just uh, believe me or, uh, or, or send me something and I'll send you a description, send me your address, and I'll send you a description of how the system has built in to it the provision for 30% of the children to get a scholarship. So in other words, I've built into my costs of the a dollar an hour, the provision to give 30% of the kids a scholarship. Hmm. Okay, I've got another question for you. Uh, you're talking about scholar dollars, okay? Uh, let's say $1,000 is equal to 50 bucks or, or whatever. I think the, the conversion ratio would be closer to 600 to 1 or 700 to 1, so oh. it would be a lot smaller than that in terms of its 
of its uh, portability into the mainstream economy. Oh, I see. Because, you know, uh, you, you're going to have kids who are going to go and say, so what? You know, I just earned 3000 bucks. So what So what can I buy? You know, big deal. My mom can buy that for me anytime I want. Yeah, some, but, but, but we'll be offering things that mom can't give them. Uh, there's all kinds of prestigious items and, and, uh, and other kinds of things. Plus, it's a game. I mean, why do you... Why do you uh, try hard in baseball or tennis or uh, jacks? Why are you playing hard at, uh, at, ju- at skip rope? Uh, because you're counting something. I mean, your mom can't give you a grade in skip rope. Um, I know one little girl, Eloisa, out in, uh, in Marina Valley. She has 150,000 scholar dollars, and she never buys anything. Um, and, and, and because to her, it's very important uh, at this moment in her life to acquire a great deal of wealth. And... Um, uh, and she feels good about herself because she has something. So different kids, different things. Yeah, but uh, how long do you think this is going to last? I mean, this this might work for kids that are eight, nine, ten years old. But when do men stop keeping score? When do you stop playing games? Well, I, I don't know. I... That's a good question. We don't know either. Al, I appreciate your call. We have to move on. Thanks for calling us on KFI. Tony of Santa Monica, you're on KFI with our guest, Marshall Fritz. Hi, James. Listen, Hi. first of all, I hope that... Uh, like this takes a permanent uh, vacation, and I hope you come <laughs> to stay because it really, like us, is mockery to the intellectuals of this country. I, I, made, I made him promise I'd leave. I'd let him come back from vacation. I got to let him come back. I and mean, you stimulate the intellectuals in this country, right. Mr. Fritz. Uh, first of all, I agree with you a thousand percent, and I know it works because people like me will donate to to an educational system like that, whereas the government could not scare me to give them one extra penny to the mockery that they call a, a public education. I call it a, a public education. The kids that go in there go backwards. I mean, they couldn't squeeze a penny out of me. And I think you'll get good teachers, and I'll tell you why I think you'll get good teachers. There's good teachers out there, but they refuse to teach because the government tells them what to teach and not what they should teach. Bingo. The things I believe that they should be teaching, as far as in the philosophical sense, are people like Aristotle, not Plato. People like Spinoza bingo. and people like Anne Rand. Yep. Bingo, bingo, bingo. You know what I'm talking about? When I was out on the road and I was, I was talking, actually I was listening to Marvin Collins and I was listening to John Saxon and listening to Jaime Escalante, and what I found is those people are right with you there, Tony. Uh, when I mentioned Anne Rand to uh, Marvin Collins, she started quoting from the Fountainhead, and then she said every kid here at Westside Prep uh, memorizes the speech, the courtroom speech. And then I was t- talking to John Saxon and... And, and the, the math, uh, uh, the algebra genius in, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, was on 60 Minutes uh, a bit ago. And, uh, and I asked him, uh, about Ayn, do you know anything about Ayn Rand? And he said, uh, who is John Gold? What happens if the machine stops? <laughs> <laughs> last, last thing, Mr. Fritz. Mr. Yes, Fritz, Tony. last thing. The only way I can see that your educational system will fail, and this is if you overlook what the private institutes, uh, private schools in this school first uh, forgot to teach the, the, the children and students. And that is this. Education is not a right. It is a privilege. That lady with the five children, she has no right to demand from you to educate her children. If she can afford it, then, yes, you, you will educate her children. I fully agree, or if someone wants to give her, or, give, or through us, give her a scholarship, but I fully agree she does not have a right. All right, Tony, thanks for your call. And we'll get you the address. I know you wanted to find out how to implement the program. We'll get the address from Marshall, our guest, Marshall Fritz, for the last two hours. Founder of Advocates for Self-Government, the guy with a great idea for education. Marshall, we're almost out of time, but let's have that address again so folks can get a hold of you. 940 East Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R, Fresno, California, 93728. Then $1 for the small kit, <laughs> an eight-page report, or $12, and you get a tape and a book. Um, money back guarantee. That's 940 East Bremer, Fresno, California, 93728. Make the check out to Advocates for Self-Government, the opposite of others' government. <laughs> Marshall, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Gene. Appreciate it. Joy to see you again. Marshall Fritz, and we hope you'll hear from Marshall again. I'm sure you will. He lives right in your area down in Fresno, so he's readily available to you. If you wish to order additional tapes or would like a catalog of materials on voluntary education, please write or call the Advocates for Self-Government. And we thank you for listening to this tape. Good day.